Okay, so I really wanted to get to at the bottom of this page here. You'll notice void functions and value returning functions. These are the two main types of functions. Some functions, in order to perform the task that they are designed to do, have to maybe do some calculating, maybe some math, and then return a value back to the function that called them. Okay, not all functions are like that, but very often we want a function that returns a value. For example, uh, if you wanted to find the square root of a number, well, probably you would want a function that would calculate the square root and return it to a variable that you could then use to print it out and possibly format it with a certain number of decimal places. But sometimes all you want to do is a function. So sometimes instead of returning a value, you might, you might want to um, <clears throat> print it out. Instead of printing it out, you might want to print out the square root, for example. Well, if that's the case, that could be a void function. A void function simply executes the statements inside of it and then terminates. But a value returning function returns a value back to the statement that called it. It's actually very nicely put right, right here on this page 211. It's a really important concept. So right away, if you're asked to write a function, you've got to make a decision. If, if it's up to you, are you going to make it a void function or are you going to make it a value returning function? Uh, quite often in, in, in your assignments, we don't give you a choice. We, we tell you that it has to be value returning or void. So you, because you do need to have, know how to do both types. So I've got a few examples to run through with you today and uh, let's, let's take a look at them. First of all, I'd like to try Funks1. Just load that up. And by the way, I'll, I'll share all these with you uh, when we're done here. I'll upload them to our a page in my courses. Okay, take a look here. Uh, what we've got here uh, are some void functions. That's all we've got in this particular program are void functions. By the way, by the way uh, here's a, an interesting way to, uh, Angelo is joining us. Hello, Angelo. <clears throat> here's an interesting way to do comments that cover multiple lines. You can use triple quotes. In this case, I'm using triple apostrophes. It, it just saves you from having to type a, a pound symbol at the start of every line. So it's kind of a nice way to do uh, comments in a program. So let's see. Custom functions. You have to use the def keyword to define the function. We've, of course, we've been doing that all along with main, def main. So the way it works is you use the def keyword, then you give the function a name. Then you have to have a set of round parentheses which may or may not have something inside them. And then you finish with the colon. And then whatever is indented after that is the body of the function. Those are the statements that will execute when you execute the function or call the function. When you run a function, the term that's used in coding is you call the function. Now, it's possible that a function might need some parameters some values inside the parentheses. Just depends on the, on the task. If that's the case, you put them inside the uh, parentheses when you're defining the function. Like for example, here, we have a program that's gonna say hello to the user. Well, we want to know what the user's name is. And so we need a parameter for user so that we can uh, address the person by name. Okay, but that's not always the case. So what we've got here, we've got actually three custom functions, as you can see here. We've got one called say hello, really simple one, has no parameters at all inside the parentheses, and it's simply going to print hello there. Pretty silly, but it is a function. Here we have a, a slightly more sophisticated one, where we specify a parameter of user, and when we run this, it's going to say hello, user, depending on what value we put in here. And then finally, we've got a more sophisticated one. Here's a function called rect area, which is going to find the area of a rectangle given the two sides of the rectangle. And of course, we know we multiply those together to get the area, and we're going to print out the area here. Now, it's not always the case that a void function 
it has a print statement in it, but uh, quite often it is. And in all three examples here, it is a print statement that's being executed in the void function. Now let's see how we could uh, use these in main. To run them in main, all we have to do is run them by name. Just like the way we run the main function down here, well, if we want to run the say hello function, we run it like this. But of course, we're going to run it inside me. So that'll run the say hello function. And you can run it as many times as you want. I'm running it twice here, as you can see. I could have put it inside of a loop and ran it 10 times if I want, which is an interesting thing you can do. That's one thing about a function is you can repeat it as many times as you want. Once you've got it working properly, you can repeat it. Now we're going to try the uh, second function, the hello, uh, hello name function, and we're going to let the name be Guido to honor the, the developer of Python. So we'll put name in here. And uh, we'll see what that gives us for the output. It should say hello Guido, I guess. And then finally, we're going to use our rectangle area function, and we're going to give it uh, side one of eight, side two of three, and then we'll run it. And that should print out the area. And then we'll repeat it with some different values using different names for the arguments here. These are called the arguments. When you actually run the function, the value that you put inside the parentheses, they are called arguments. This function has a single argument. This function has two arguments. The, now here's a really key concept. The arguments become passed into the parameters. So the argument name becomes known inside the hello name function as user. See, this is, this is kind of like a generic name, user. But we can put anything, any string at all in here would work. Likewise here. When we define the rect area function, we use side one and side two as the parameters. But when we go to use it, we can actually put all kinds of different values in there as long as they're two numeric values. And in that case, we're specifying the arguments or args. So here we have the args S1 and S2. Here we have args D1 and D2. Okay, well, let's see how this thing runs. Let's give it a run. Here's the output of that program. And you can see it's pretty simple output, but notice we got the uh, say hello function ran twice because we, we executed it twice here. So we got hello there twice. Uh, when we tried hello name with Guido as the argument, right? That's the argument. And it uh, said hello Guido, which is what we would expect. And then we tried the uh, rect area function of three and eight and five and eight. And of course that gives us areas of 24 and 40. So keep this in mind. Here we're defining your function. Okay, you have to define a function before you can use it. Do that with the def keyword. Then you execute or run the function also, also uh, terminology used is you call the function and you call it by its name. So when when Python reads this line of code, Python says, hmm, there must be a function called say hello somewhere in this file. Let's see. Oh yeah, here it is. I'll do this. Okay, that, that's, that's the way Python looks at this. Python interpreter sees a function call. It looks for a definition of the function and then executes the code that is inside the function. And that code has to be indented. If this isn't indented, this will crash, right? It's got to be indented. So this is an example of some void functions. Any question about this at all? Can I expand that? Okay, no problems there. Okay. Well, those are void functions. Let's take a look at another. I will save that. Let's take a look at uh, functs two. This, I believe, has some value returning functions in it. 
Okay, this one's about value returning functions, as you can see up here. Functions that return a value, return a value back to the function that calls them. Usually that's main, but not necessarily. To be useful, the value returned, and here's a key concept, the value returned has to be caught or used in some way in the main function. If a function returns a value, you gotta catch it. Or it's like playing ball and somebody threw the ball over your head. You don't get to play with the ball. Well, you don't get to, to play with the return value if you don't catch it. So let's take a look at, at the, in this case, I defined the functions down below main. It doesn't matter where you put them as long as they're in the same file. So let's see, we've got a function called circ area. And to find the area of a circle, well, you need to know the radius to find the area of a circle. So we'll give it a, a parameter when we define it called rad. And of course, what we're going to do with uh, to get the area, it's going to be pi times radius squared. As, as you know, double asterisk means uh, exponentiation. So that's, I could have put rad times rad, I suppose that would work too. So that should return the area. Now, I didn't use a sec separate variable. I could have said area equals 3.1416 times rad to the power of 2, and then return area. But why, why make two statements if, if just one will do? You can just return and then do the math. So that should calculate the area of a circle and return it. Now, look at how we're going to call that. This is the definition of the function. Here, we're going to call the function up here. Well, look, when we call it, we're going to give it an argument of 10 radius. The radius is our argument with the value of 10. That radius is going to be passed in as rad inside the circ area function. Now, as we execute the function, because it returns a value, we've got to catch it in a variable. So it's an assignment statement. You know, it's the equal sign, which means assignment. So this function does its job returns a value which is caught and stored in the variable called area, which we can then print out with a uh, print statement and format it with three decimal places here. So uh, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to comment out this part of the program temporarily here. So you can do like that. And I'm going to run this program and we'll just see what we get. Yeah, we've got the circle area as being the uh, what you would expect here, pi times uh, 100 with three decimal places. So that seems to be working properly. Okay, so I have to catch the value here. If, if, I, uh, if I don't have that assignment, if I run it like this, it doesn't do anything, it doesn't generate any output because I don't have anything here. I don't have an area variable. Now, as we'll see in a moment, there is another way that you can do this. I'm just going to fix that back up again. So is everybody okay with what's going on here? There's a lot going on in this line right here. Very important that you understand what this line is doing. When Python reads this line, it says to itself, there's a function called circ area somewhere in this file. So it comes down here and it finds it. And then it looks at this and says, oh, there's a parameter called rad. So I'm supposed to take the radius and, and let it be known as rad inside this function. It has a value of 10. So it's going to calculate pi times the radius squared and return it back to main, in this case, where it gets assigned to this variable area. So there's a lot going on in that one line there. It runs all the code that's defined down here returns the value and stores it in this variable here so that we can print it out in main. Now we could have made it a void function. We could have printed the circular, uh, the area down here. But what if I wanted to add some areas together? That wouldn't work. I'd have to return the value so that I could add up a couple of areas. Are you okay with why that works the way it does? Any question about that? This is critically important stuff. I want to just mention the concept of, of scope. This variable here is only accessible in main. It's only visible in main. The terminology that's used in coding is radius is in scope in main. The scope of radius is the main function. 
The scope of rad is the SERP area function. Main doesn't know what rad is. CERC area doesn't know what radius is. In fact, if I if I put uh, radius here, this program will crash. Try it just for the heck of it. Try radius right there. Run this again. I'll get an error message here. Radius is not defined. The CERC area function doesn't know anything about the radius because it's not in scope. Variables are known inside the functions in which they are declared. The so, one doesn't see the other. Part, that's right, that's right. Now, actually it is possible to do something, um, I, I usually don't do it because it can be confusing, but I could, I could put radius here and radius here, but they would be different variables. You can actually use the same name inside different functions, but they're actually two different places in memory. They're actually separate variables. So to do so can be kind of confusing, particularly when you're starting out with functions. So I try to avoid it. Now I want to bring back this. Any questions about that before we carry on though? No. Okay, good. All right, so I'm going to bring this back by uncommenting that region. And uh, let's look at our next function here. Okay, what we want to do is we want to find the higher. Let's, let's look at the definition first here. We have a, a function called find high, which is going to take two parameters, num1 and num2, and it's going to, its uh, objective is to return the higher of the two numbers, the larger of the two. So we could do that. Uh, we need to make a decision inside the function, right? If num1 is greater than num2, return num1, else return num2. That should do it. Okay, so this code here will, will run when we run the find high function. So let's see, here we're going to use uh, these values up here, n1 and n2. Notice I didn't use num1 and num2, but I could have. It, okay, but they would be different variables, but I think it's confusing to do so. So we're going to find the higher number is, now here's where we're executing the function. Now, this time we're doing it a little bit differently from what we did up here. Up here when we executed the function, it wasn't embedded inside of another function. But this time we are embedding the find high function inside the print function. So the way that works, Python runs this first, which turns it into a, a value because we're returning the either num1 or num2 here. And then it becomes part of the uh, arguments for the print function. In this case, the print function is taking two arguments. First argument is a string, this big string here, and the second argument is the function call find high. So this executes first, becomes a number, which then becomes part of the print. We call this an, an embedded catch. We're catching it embedded. Now, we, actually, we've done stuff like that before because when we use the input function and we wanted to get an integer from the keyboard from the user, if you recall, we embedded the input function inside the int function because the input function returns a string and then int converts that string into an int. So we've actually done stuff like this before. Here we're, here we're embedding the format function inside the print function. So that sort of thing happens all the time in coding where you embed one function call inside of another. This returns, see that lets you know that this returns the value, the format function returns a string with three decimal places. Okay, so uh, now we're, got, we're gonna uh, do one more. We've got one more function. Let's take a look at it here. We're gonna carpet a room. And let's say that uh, we're gonna carpet the room. Uh, we have to have the dimensions of the room. We need to know the length and the width of the room. We're going to calculate the area of the room in square yards, and we're going to assume that the uh, carpet is being sold by the square yard. So here's a function that we can use to carpet a room and see how much it would cost. We need three different parameters, the length, the width, and the cost of the carpet per square yard. What we're going to do is we're going to multiply the uh, length times the width and divide it by nine, because there are nine square feet in a square yard, right? three by three. And then 
will return the area times the cost per yard. Now we could have, we didn't really need to calculate the area. We could have said return dim one times dim two slash nine times cost per yard. We could have done it with one line, but sometimes if it can get overly complex if you do that. So this, this function carpet room should tell us how much it costs to carpet a room. Well, here, here's how we're going to use it up here. We're going to assume our room is 15 by 12 and we're going to get carpet that's uh, 24.99 per square yard. So we'll run the carpet room function with those three arguments. These are now the arguments which become known as these parameters inside the function <clears throat> and it should do all this calculating and return a value into this variable cost, which we can then print out in currency format using our dollar sign and SEP equals nothing so that the dollar sign is right up against the first digit. So let's give this one a call. All right. We're gonna call the main function here and let's give it a run. Okay, so there's, there's the uh, output that I got. <clears throat> Circle area, higher number of course is 19. Cost of the carpet in this case is $499.80. All of these functions return a value. Notice they all have a return statement. This one has two return statements, one in each uh, block, one in the if block, one in the else block. Yeah, function, if the function is it returns a value, it's got to have a return statement. So just to recap, these were value returning functions. They return a value back to the function that calls them, in this case, the main function. But you gotta catch that return value in a variable or embed it in another function such as print or format. Okay. Any questions about that one? Any part of this that I can explain better? I think one of the, the trickier concepts is the difference between the arguments and the parameters. Just remember that these are the arguments. What, when we actually run the function in main, what you provide to the function inside the parameters, these are called the arguments. They become known as these values internally inside the carpet room function. You have to get them in the same order, by the way. Side one, dim one, side two, dim two, carpet, cost per yard. The order is important. Okay, and not hearing any questions, I'm going to go on to the next one that we wanted to take a look at. The next thing I wanted to look at was um, something that we, we would like you not to do. If you, if you look at page 236 in the ebook, get the ebook back here. If you look at page uh, 236, you'll see some uh, discussion there of globals. Well, we, we don't want you to use globals, actually, I guess it's on the page previous where they introduced the concept of globals. <clears throat> Global variables are variables that can be, uh, have scope anywhere inside the program. But as, oh gosh, I'm going to use this. Let me get back there. Yep, there we go. Hmm. This one I need. Yeah, here, here's the where it's introduced global variables and global constants on page 235. The thing about globals, it's accessible to all the functions in the program, in the, in the entire file. But that's considered bad practice. I want you to take a look at what's at the bottom of page 236. Most programmers agree that you should restrict restrict the use of global variables or not use them at all because they can cause problems. So you, you're going to see that in the instructions for your uh, programs from here on in, I think. Do not use global variables. 
Now, a global constant is okay. For example, like pi 3.1416, that's okay, but not, not a global variable. They just cause problems, make uh, debugging difficult. They can sometimes make a program hard to understand. Global constants, however, are okay. So it's permissible to use these. Okay. I just wanted to point that out. And then the next thing that I would like to take a look at is the random module, which is also in this chapter. Let's see where it kicks in. Uh, right here on page 239. We can generate random numbers. Every programming language has this capability. Python is no different. And uh, we can generate all sorts of random numbers. Very often, people that do statistics, for example, they need to have some random numbers to work with. Well, they'll generate some random numbers using these uh, random number generating features of Python. And the way it's done with Python is there is a module called random. I think we might have used it once or twice already. But there is a random module that you can use to generate random numbers. And it's covered on the next few pages here. But yeah, commonly used in games, for example, random numbers. And in order to generate random numbers, you have to import the random module there's the line that you need to have in your programs. You have to import the random module. So we, we've got a couple of uh, programs that uh, demonstrate that. Let's have a look here. We've got one called random nums. Just open that up, take a look at it. Okay, here we are. I'm gonna import the random module, but here's the thing. Whenever I want to use one of the functions that's in the random module, I have to say random dot and then the name of the function. Well, that can get kind of old pretty quickly if you have a lot of random module functions that you want to use. So what you can do is you can use a short form alias. And uh, sometimes I use R, this time I'm using RA to represent the random module. That's called an alias for the module name. Now, what's in the random module? All sorts of functions for generating random values. One of them is just called random. The random function makes a floating point number from zero to almost one. So it's, it's for a very small value. It could be zero, but it never gets to be one. It could be up to 0 0.9999999, about 16 values, but it never gets up to one. That's what the random function does. So what we're going to do here is you, you, you can see this is a loop that's going to run four times. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to use ra.random. ra is the alias for the random module. And we're going to run the random function and print out four random numbers all in the same line. You get 16 decimal places in those when I run that. The, by default, you get 16 decimal places, which is a little bit uh, overwhelming. So I'm going to use the uh, format function here, and I'll format them in the second uh, loop that we run. We'll format them with four decimal places instead. There's also a uh, uniform function. The uniform function gives you random floating point numbers between n1 and, and n2. So, for example, in this case, we're going to generate random numbers between 20 and 30 using the uniform function of the random module. So let's um, let's see what this runs like. There's the output I got. Uh, yeah, there's the uh, there's the four random numbers. And notice you get 16 decimal places for each one, but you'll never get anything up. You never get one. You, here's one that's pretty close to one, as you can see. Uh, you could get a zero, but any value from 0, 0.0 up to almost one. Here are some other random numbers using that same function, but this time I've ran, rounded them off to four decimal places with the format function. And then finally, here are the random numbers from 20 to 30. As you can see, these are all from 20 to 30. 
And I'm going to run it again because every time I run this, I just get a different set of values. As you can see, they are generally truly random numbers being generated. I believe these numbers are, are generated randomly based on the clock, the system clock that's running in your computer. There are other, other ways that this can be done, but not in this module. The random module generates these values. So what about random integers? All of these are floating point numbers. Let's take a look at another example called randoms2. This one. It's going to work with random integers. And uh, we're going to generate random integers again. Once again, we're importing random as RA. And I thought what we could do is we could uh, generate a bunch of random integers, and then we'll determine uh, how many of them are odd, how many are even, and also the sum of the odds and the sum of the evens. So what we've got here is I've got two accumulators. We're going to use those to add up the odd numbers and the even numbers. You always initialize the accumulators to an initial value of zero. And then I've got two counters here. I'm going to count the even numbers and the odd numbers. Once again, you initialize counters to zero as well. So every time we get an even number, we'll add one on to the evens variables. Now, well, I want to make eight random numbers. The randint function is how you generate random integers. And the way it works with 1, 20, you get values between 1 and 20, and you could get a 1 and you could get a 20. So in other words, it's inclusive, 1 through 20, inclusive. Not, it's not like range where, where you stop at uh, 19. Although there is a rand range in the random module that does work that way. So uh, what we're going to do is we're going to print all those on one line. But after we print them, we also want to do some determination on the odd and even nature of those values. So what we'll do, as you know, the way we detect an even number is if the remainder is zero when we divide it by two. So we use the remainder operator, the percent symbol, and divide by two. If we get a value of zero, we know that it's even number. Well, if it's an even number, we want to increment the counter. We just want to add one onto the counter, but we want to add the even number into the sum so that the num will be added onto the, the even sum value. That's your accumulation. Accumulators always go up by the value of another variable. Counters always go up by one, the increment counters. And of course, if it's not an even number, it must be an odd number. So we'll uh, do the same thing with the odd numbers down here. And because we were printing on a line without finishing the line and using the end operator here, then I've got a blank print here to finish that line and then we'll indicate how many evens we found and what their total is, and we'll do the same for the odds. So let's give this a run. Where's the output I got? <clears throat> As you can see, we did get eight random numbers. They're all between one and 20. I got, a, I got uh, some duplicates, but that's okay. That's not a problem. There's a way of getting around that, but we haven't covered it. And let's see, apparently there's six even numbers. Is that true? And one, two, three, four, five, six. Yeah, six even numbers and two odd numbers. Two odd numbers total 12. Yes, seven and five are the odd numbers and they do total 12. So it looks like it's working okay. Now, the nice thing about this is, of course, we can run this as many times as we want. Let's try it. Different set of numbers, different total, different counts. This is pretty cool, no? This is, this is kind of a nifty little program because we're doing quite a bit here. What we aren't doing is using a custom function, but we could. And, and in fact, I think you have to do that for your assignment. Run a custom function that generates random numbers. Okay, ra.randint. 1 comma 20. Now, if I wanted a different range, if I wanted to get random numbers between 100 and 200, for example, just, no, all I'd have to do is change this. I would have to change the comment, but I won't bother. 
I'll just run it again without changing the comment. There's the random numbers between 100 and 200. Once again, I got six even and two odd. You never know what you're going to get because it is random. You could generate random numbers and uh, generate a lottery ticket. Right? To generate a lottery ticket, see what happens. Not, not promoting gambling, but you could get six random numbers. In that case, though, you would not want any repeats. So you'd have to create what's called a set. But we're not covering that. Be okay with why this runs the way it does? Using the random module to get random integers, random function. Now remember, you can always test these in the interactive window too. Like I could say right here, import random as maybe R. That makes it available instead of RA. And then I could try uh, R dot randint. And I could try uh, 500, 1,000, 940. Remember, you can always test these functions in the interactive window. Okay, I hope you're okay with that. That's the random module. Now, functions can return not just numbers. You could return a string. You could return um, a Boolean value, like you could return true or false as well. Okay, you don't have to return a number. It could be a string. It could be a Boolean, any value at all. But I wanted to take a look next at the, uh, at the math module. Another part of this chapter is the math module. It uh, comes into play on page 263. So I'm going to pop up to page 263, where you'll see the some functions of the math module. Once again, this is a module that you have to import. See, a lot of functions in Python are available to you without doing any imports, like print, input, format, those are functions that we don't have to import. But specialized functions, in this case like math functions, we have to import the math module in order to use these functions. And as you can see, there, there, there are trigonometric ones, like trigonometry. Somebody may have studied trig in math. Uh, there's exponents. There's an interesting one. If you want to find the hypotenuse of a uh, right angle triangle, you can use the hypot. X and Y being the other two sides. And the answer, uh, this will return the... Uh, Notice what it says here. These are value returning functions. It returns the hypotenuse. There are some logarithmic functions. Here's a squirt function, square root. It gives you the square root of a number. And there are more. There are more than this. You could look them up if you wanted. You could look them up right here. Just go to the documentation. If you Google Python 3 math, functions. That'll take you to the official documentation. You can see many, many more functions here. Here's one here called factorial, which I think I've got an example coming up for you. Um, here's an interesting one. Greatest common divisor of two numbers. So there's all kinds of nifty functions that have all been tricked out by Guido and his friends and put into a math module so that you can import it. There are some constants too, like the math.py gives you a really good accurate value for a pi if you need to use that in a, in a formula, math.py. And there's also the uh, value of e, which some of you might have run into in your advanced math. Okay, so that's the math module. Any questions about that one? And by the way, we could test that one in the uh, uh, interactive window as well. Let's say if we uh, bring back that, uh, here we are here, got one called math module. Let's take a look at it. 
Okay, we're going to we're going to import math as M A. I could have said M. Actually, math isn't such a long thing to have to type, so it's not that bad. But we're going to assign 25 to a variable known. Then I want to see what the square root of that is, so I'll use M A dot square root of known. That's the argument, and it's going to do its job. Now the def it's all defined in the math module. We don't have to change it. We can't change it. In fact, here's the hypot function. We want to get the hypotenuse of a right angle triangle. Well, we use ma dot hypot with s1 and s2. And we're going to say that side one is 12 and side two is five. We get the hypotenuse, returns the value which we'll store in the variable hyp. And then finally here, uh, I thought we'd try a little bit with some of these other interesting functions like floor. The floor function rounds down the number. Basically, it truncates the number, it drops any decimal part that the number might have. The ceiling function goes up to the next higher integer. So the ceiling of 15, we're going to find is 16, 15.035. The ceiling of that is the next higher integer, which of course would be 16. And here's that factorial function for the factorial of 5. So I'll just give this a run and see what we get. Here's the output of, of that program. Yeah, of course, the square root of 25 is 5. Hypotenuse is 13 for uh, sides, right angle triangle with sides of 5 and 12. The hypotenuse will be 13. And here you can see the floor. The floor rounding down is 15. You just lose the decimal. Rounding up, of course, you get 16. In factorial 5 is 20. Factorial 5 means 5 times 4 times 3 times 2 times 1, which does work out to be uh, 120. So that's a little bit about the math module. Now, I could have left this off, but if I take that off, then I'd have to say math dot square root, right? And it would work. I could take this away. Then everywhere where I've got math, or MA, I'd have to say math, math dot, which is fine. But I'd have to do that through the entire program. So I'm going to undo that and save it. So that's the math module. One more concept to cover, and that is making your own modules. Comes up on the next page in our textbook. You can make your own modules, your, your custom modules. And you will do that. If you become a professional Python programmer, you will make your own modules because you will be writing functions and you will group functions that are similar into a module, save them in a file. And that's all a module is. A module is just a Python file with the, with the uh, name of .py, and uh, it contains the definitions of functions. It doesn't have the main function, just the definition of the custom functions that you can make yourself. And you can put as many as you want in a module. And as soon as you do that, you can import that module in another program that has a main function, and all of the functions that are in the module become available to you. So it's a, it's a very interesting concept. And most programming languages have something similar. They might not call it a module. They might call it a package or uh, some other term. So this allows you to organize your code a little bit. So uh, this is a pr pretty good example that's in the textbook. Let's say you wanted to. Uh, Calculate some areas. Maybe maybe you want to work with circles and rectangles. Well, if you're working with circles, the area and circumference are important things that you might want to work out. If you're working with rectangles, the area and the perimeter might be something that you would want to calculate. Well, you could put a formula, four formulas, one for each one of these. You put four formulas in a module, save that module file, and then you could import it as necessary to use those functions. So I've got one example similar to that that we can take a look at here. So let's, uh, let's see if we can find that. We've got a, um, an areas module. Take a look at this. I'm gonna open that up with idle. And look, no main, no main function. These are custom area functions. I've only got two. We could add lots more. I'm calling it areas.py, but there's no main function. 
what we have is definitions of other custom functions. So I've got one for the rectangle area. Rectangle, to get the area of a rectangle, of course, we have to know the sides, the lengths of the sides. And this is a void function, right? You can see that this is a void function. This function is not going to return the area. It's going to print the area. So that's a void function. The other function is for the area of a circle. This one is a little different. In order to get the area of a circle, you need to know the radius. So that's a required parameter there. And in this case, we're going to return the area. Okay. Well, I could, I could add more. I could uh, have the area of a parallelogram. I could have the uh, surface area of a sphere, surface area of a, of a box, all kinds of area formulas that we could add in here. And uh, then we could use them in a program. And as an example of that, we have use areas here. And here's a program that's going to import the areas module that we just looked at. We're going to give it an alias of just A. And that means all of the, by the way, notice it's not areas.py. The module name was areas.py, but you leave off the .py when you import it. So we import areas as A. Now we're going to use that in a main program here. So we're going to ask the user to type in the uh, radius of a circle as a floating point number. And then we're going to run the circ area method, the circ area function, I should say, circ area function back here. And it's going to return a value. Well, I have to use the A to indicate the module name, A dot circ area. And we're going to catch the value in a variable called area. And then we can print that out formatted in this case to four decimal places. So that, that was the value returning function. But then we also want to uh, work on this, demonstrate the use of this function, the rect area function. And so uh, we need to know the lengths of the sides of the rectangle, side one and side two. And now we're going to call the function. And because this is a void function, we don't have to catch the return value. All we have to do is use our alias for our areas module, a dot rect area, and give it the arguments, side one and side two. So when we run this one, we enter the circle, circle radius uh, of 10.5. That works out to this value for area. And for the side of the rectangle, I'll put in some numbers that I'm pretty sure we know what that's going to work out to so we can verify it. Yeah, 20 times 30 would give us an area of, uh, of 600. So we've got our own custom module. Admittedly, not a complex one, but we do have our own custom module there. And we could add more formulas, and uh, they would all be available to us as long as we imported them areas module. You have to create a custom module as part of your assignment for this chapter. That's it. I'm, uh, I have no more stuff to present. Any questions at all, folks? Mm -hmm. Okay. Pretty sure pop up wants to start working on this. Yeah, yeah, perhaps, yeah. Well, this has been recorded, so you can come back to it. Uh, I'll put the recording up on our uh, course page. Uh, see if I can... Uh, Yeah, here, I've got a different window to show you here. Here's, here's the actual assignment for, for chapter five. First thing you want to do, program number one, is supposed to have a main function and a void function. Um, this should generate a specified number of random integers in a specified range and print them all in one line separated by spaces. So your custom function has to have three integer parameters. One for how many numbers to generate, one for the low value of the range, one for the high value of the range. So here's how it should run. How many random numbers do you want? In this case, eight. The lowest number should be uh, 20. The highest number would be 50. So here, here are the eight numbers. And then we have another sample run. We get 12 numbers between 30 and 80. It should run like this. So you have to define a custom function with three parameters. And when you run the function in main, with this of course is main running here in the sample output. When you run the function in main, you have to uh, 
make sure you uh, uh, darn it, lost it here. Okay, come back to that. Here it is. <clears throat> when you run the function in main, you're going to be using the input values as the arguments for the function. Okay, let's look at 5.2. This is a, a program for the express lane at a supermarket, less than 10 items. This is uh, going to use a main function and a value returning function called subtotal. It's a pretty good program. It's a pretty good program because it features a loop and you also have to have a custom function called subtotal with no parameters, no parameters, so nothing inside the parentheses. But inside this custom function, we should prompt the user for the unit price and quantity and then calculate and print the subtotal and also return the subtotal. So as well as printing the subtotal, you have to return the subtotal back to main so that all of the items can be totaled up for the final total. Here's two sample outputs. And the very last thing is a uh, three, five, three, uh, which you have to create a module called convert.py, your custom module with three functions, two void functions, one that converts from Fahrenheit to Celsius, and another that converts from Celsius to Fahrenheit, and then a value returning function that takes a distance in miles and prints the equivalent distance in kilometers. And here's a sample run here. So you got to make your own custom function with those three function definitions, and then you got to import it to test them. That's all I have for you. Anything else, folks? Any questions at all that I can help you with? I guess the only question I have is going back to some of the, uh, I guess it's like chapter, I'm sorry, module three. So you've recorded all of the previous uh, classes Unfortunately, not. Unfortunately, it didn't work out so well. But um, uh, this one is being recorded. Okay. And I'll upload it uh, in 20 minutes or so. It takes a little bit of time to get processed up to YouTube. Okay, well, that's it then, folks. If you have no questions, thank you for attending. And... Uh, We'll do more of this stuff tomorrow. We'll write some more custom functions tomorrow. That's what you got to do to get good at writing functions. You have to write lots of them. Practice, practice, practice. Same way you get to Carnegie Hall. Okay. Thank you very much, folks. We're gone.